Uh, we're now coming back to the economic cycle with a keynote by Dr. Sarah Hunter, Assistant Governor for Economics at the Reserve Bank of Australia. Sarah will, of course, be familiar to all of you in the room, and I'm sure you'd all agree she always brings thought to the economic debate. Today, Sarah's going to talk to the labour market, relevant particularly in light of the recent debate and associated market volatility from US payrolls. For the Q&A, Sarah will be joined by Jonathan Kearns, Chief Economist at Challenger, and Felicity Emmett, the Senior Director for Macro Research at Oz Super and me. I'm not sure what you call a group of economists, but a gaggle of views would be one idea. Certainly, I'd suggest you get your questions ready for that panel. Before that, though, uh, can I please ask you to join me in welcoming Sarah? Thank you, Joe. That's a, a lovely introduction. I love being part of the gaggle of economists that uh, uh, cover Australia and, and spend our time uh, looking and researching such a fascinating country. Uh, so I would like to first uh, pay my respects to uh, the traditional and original owners of this land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, to pay respect to those who have passed before us and to acknowledge today's custodians of this land. I also extend that respect to any First Nations people joining us here today. So, as, as Joe mentioned, today I'd like to talk about the labour market. Uh, so, employment is crucial to our living standards and our lives. A job is not just a source of income. For many of us, it is also a key part of our identity and way of life. Those that experience a period of unemployment can suffer for a long time afterwards, and the economy can lose, as it were, their skills and expertise. The Reserve Bank Board has historically set monetary policy to achieve both low and stable inflation and full employment. Our full employment mandate became more explicit in the updated statement on the conduct of monetary policy that was agreed between the Reserve Bank Board and the Treasurer late last year. So this morning, I'd like to unpack our view of the labour market, how we've interpreted recent data, and what we expect over the next couple of years. But first, I want to outline what we mean by and how we assess full employment. Then I'll follow with our assessment of labour market dynamics, whether we think they've changed and where we've been somewhat surprised recently. And finally, I'll wrap up by talking about our outlook and the risks and uncertainties that we're closely monitoring. So first, starting with our definition of full employment uh, and then unpacking some of the complexities around how we measure it. Well, uh, bear with me, it's a bit of an economist definition coming up. We define full employment as the maximum level of employment that is consistent with low and stable inflation. When the economy is at full employment, demand and supply in the labour market are in balance. In turn, this means wages growing at a rate consistent with achieving the inflation target after accounting for growth and productivity. And in the medium term, this coincides with a balance between demand and supply in the markets for goods and services. Uh, that's somewhat wordy, but at least it's, as an objective, it's easy to describe. Unfortunately, it's rather more difficult to measure or capture in a single metric. So it may not be a surprise that we use a range of methods and indicators to understand how the current state of the labour market compares to full employment and to understand how much uncertainty there is around our assessment. So, while the unemployment rate is a key metric in our analysis and is often uh, the metric of focus, we do consider a range of different measures to holistically assess the labour market. These include leading indicators, such as firms' employment intentions, measures of unmet demand, such as vacancies, and other cyclical measures of underutilisation, such as the medium term and youth unemployment rates and the underemployment rate. We also use a suite of models to estimate the unemployment rate and hours based underutilisation rate. Uh, the underutilisation rate is a broader measure of spare capacity, which captures the shortfall in hours both from those that are unemployed and those that are working but want to work more hours, the underemployed. Uh, and we look at what would, of those two metrics would be consistent with full employment. These models use wages growth and inflation to provide us with information on the balance between demand and supply in the labour market and in the economy. If inflationary pressures appear persistent, it may suggest that there remains excess demand in the economy and labour market. Deviations of the actual unemployment and hours-based underutilisation rates from these estimates, namely the gaps in those two variables, provide yet another metric of the degree of tightness in the labour market. 
I want to draw out another critical point. The level of full employment, that is the absolute number of people employed, can change over time as the structure of the economy and the labour market evolve. The maximum number of people employed that is consistent with us achieving our price stability mandate will increase as the population grows, or if the labour force participation rate rises, or if both are happening at once, as has happened in recent times. So it's also useful for us to monitor trends in the employment to population ratio and the participation rate. So there's a lot of information there. What does all of that mean for our current assessment of the labour market? Well, taking into account the methods and indicators that I've just taken you through, our current assessment is that the labour market is operating above full employment, but has moved towards better balance since late 2022. So in the context of the first graph that I showed, we can see that a range of labour market indicators have eased since late 2022. On that chart, the dots have moved from uh, the right into the middle or even towards the left for some of them. So, for example, firms' employment intentions are now comfortably within their historical average range. Our models also suggest that the unemployment and underutilisation gaps have narrowed, which also points to a labour market that is moving towards full employment. This assessment is based on what we know right now. It, that's always true. And from here, the return to full employment could play out in many ways. This will be determined by developments across the economy and in the labour market, and so monitoring these developments is a crucial part of how we assess the overall outlook. So, what can I then tell you now about the dynamics that we see running through the labour market and how we think that easing might go from here? Well, as many of you will know, when the economy begins to soften, the first thing firms generally do is to pull back on unmet demand for workers. That is, they recruit less intensely, and that means they put out fewer new job adverts, for example, or they might cancel pre-existing vacancies that they were previously looking to fill. A softening of the labour market through this channel is not captured in data series, such as the level of employment or the unemployment rate. In fact, overall de demand for labour can be falling even when employment is rising. So we can see vacancies coming down, but we're still filling jobs and increasing employment. During the current cycle, we first observed declines in both job vacancies and measures of employment intentions from business surveys and the RBA's liaison program in 2022. At the time, conditions were very tight and there were many vacant positions. As momentum in demand started to moderate, firms responded to the slowing uh, by withdrawing positions or posting viewer vacancies. And the vacancy rate has subsequently fallen since then, but remains above its pre-pandemic level. To date, the decline in vacancies has coincided with only a modest increase in the unemployment rate. And the typically inverse relationship between vacancies and unemployment is what economists call the beverage curve. That's the chart I'm showing you right now. The economy appears to have been operating on the steeper portion of the curve of late. That's the dots that are highlighted in red. Uh, where a fall in vacancies can occur without a large increase in the unemployment rate. We also can't see clear evidence that the curve has permanently shifted over the pandemic years. For example, if the curve had shifted out, this would suggest that matching workers to job had, jobs had become harder. Now, this could be because firms are demanding new or different skills that the pre-existing labour force doesn't have, or because workers aren't able to move to the sectors or regions where there are job openings. Our current assessment is that this hasn't happened, in other words, we think the labour market today is operating broadly the way it did prior to the pandemic. So while we've not seen a sharp lift in the unemployment rate, the decline in demand for labour and firms' hiring intentions has translated into a lower rate of new hiring and slower employment growth. We can see this in the rate at which job seekers have been able to find work. So the job finding rate, that's the proportion of those uh, that are unemployed that find a job in any given month. Um, we can see that this has declined. It rose to multi-decade highs in 2022, as you can see on the chart, uh, but it's fallen back since then, although it remains above the level we saw in the 2010s. So this observation is consistent with people taking a little bit longer to find work if they're looking for it. And all else equal, this dynamic does contribute to a higher unemployment rate. Firms can also respond to slowing growth in demand by reducing the hours of their pre-existing workforce. Now, we know this is easier for some roles and sectors than others, 
And overall, we may therefore observe a reduction in average hours worked per employee. And average hours worked did indeed decline over much of 2023. But the level this year has not fallen materially uh, over the last, well, we're now close to eight months of data. And looking through the volatility we've seen this year, it's basically been broadly steady, as you can see on this chart. The data also highlight the volatility we've seen in average hours over the past four years relative to the pre-COVID years. And so understanding how it might evolve from here is a key uncertainty in our forecasts. Will it remain steady? Will it uh, return to a downward trend? These are all questions we're tackling. Similar to average hours, other measures of labour underutilisation have also not increased noticeably in recent months. As an example, the underemployment rate, which captures workers who would like to work more hours, rose in 2023, but has been relatively steady since earlier this year. The limited signs of further easing in the latest observations for these variables, um, at a time when economic growth has continued to slow, is somewhat surprising. It's a puzzle. Uh, for us, I think for, for many of my colleagues in the private sector too. Uh, and it's a key uncertainty in the outlook. I'll return to this point later on. But just taken together, uh, these observations suggest that conditions in the labour market remain tighter than implied by full employment. In a downturn, particularly in a more severe downturn, firms may also turn to layoffs to reduce labour costs. This would further raise the unemployment rate and we know for individuals this would be a challenging situation to face. Past downturns tell us that firms generally resist laying off staff, if possible, as they try to avoid the costs associated with rehiring and reskilling workers as the economic outlook improves. Now, the layoffs rate is always positive. There are always some firms restructuring, repositioning, perhaps closing down. And again, we know for the people um, that are impacted by that, the individuals, that that's a challenging situation for them to face. Uh, and it's also the case that uh, the uh, layoffs rate has been, apologies, has been trending up recently. But it does remain very low by historic standards. And our assessment is that this is consistent with the labour market loosening from very tight conditions, but still operating above full employment. Changes to the layoffs rate is another key metric that we're monitoring. Conditions in the labour market are also typically reflected in the pace of wages growth. And tightness in the labour market has contributed to strengthen wages growth in recent years. More recently, there are some signs that the easing in the labour market since late 2022 has started to flow through to wage outcomes for workers. Nominal wages growth appears to have passed its peak and has moderated since late last year, though wages growth does remain solid. Having said this, real wages, which matter more for households, have been weaker. And this highlights and reinforces the costs of high inflation, which Governor Bullock spoke about last week. Moreover, growth of labour costs, as measured by growth of labour costs per unit of output, has also declined, in part due to an improvement in productivity outcomes. So, that's a bit of a summary of labour market dynamics and how we might see cycles th play through. What has typically happened in the past? Well, it is important for us to put the recent easing into the context of historical episodes so we can better forecast how the labour market is likely to evolve from here. Overall, our current assessment is that the recent easing in labour market conditions has, to date, been similar to mild downturns that we've seen uh, in the previous economic history for Australia. Excluding the pandemic period, Downturns in economic activity and their associated impacts on labour market outcomes were larger in the early 1980s and 1990s compared to downturns in the 2000s and 2010s, and as you can see on the chart here. This is shown by the magnitude of declines in total hours worked, which accounts for both, both changes in employment and average hours worked. In the current episode, the decline in total hours worked has come from reductions in average hours worked, rather than declines in employment. And that's a repeat, broadly speaking, of the patterns that we've seen in the most recent episodes. Now, a likely explanation for this is that most recent downturns have been smaller in magnitude, or the decline in GDP, uh, or indeed we haven't seen the decline in GDP uh, in the current downturn, and we didn't see that in the, the 2010s or in the GFC. Uh, we did see that in the 1980s and the 1990s. 
So that's likely to be playing a part in this. Um, but it may also reflect, uh, partly reflect, increased flexibility in the labour market. This has allowed firms to contain labour costs while retaining employees and avoid the costs associated with layoffs and rehiring. It has also meant fewer layoffs and smaller increases in the unemployment rate, which has kept more workers in jobs. With the recent adjustment in total hours arising via average hours worked, total employment has continued to increase, notwithstanding the unemployment rate rising uh, from late 22 onwards. Aggregate employment growth has also been supported by the rebound in migration since late 2021, which has contributed to both an increase in the supply and demand via migrants' consumption of goods and services for labour. Employment growth has also been uneven across sectors, with aggregate employment supported by strong growth in the health, education and public admin sectors. Importantly, the labour market appears to be doing a pretty good job of facilitating this flow of workers to these industries. Our preliminary analysis of the healthcare sector, for example, suggests that it has drawn significantly from those who are outside the labour force or unemployed, while also bringing in some people previously employed in other industries. So what has been surprising and, and what has been in line with our thinking? Well, I definitely don't want to create an impression that we know everything about the labour market, particularly about how it will evolve from here. But there are some things that we've seen that, that haven't been too surprising. In particular, uh, the recent unemployment rate outcomes have not been abnormal or unusual uh, given the historical relationship between changes in the unemployment rate and GDP growth rate. So uh, put another way, we've seen a slowing in the economy in terms of the pace of growth in, in demand and GDP, and we've seen a lift in the unemployment rate, and that's what we've seen in the past. What has been more surprising is the strength in the labour force participation rate and, as discussed earlier, the limited easing more recently in some measures such as the underemployment rate and average hours worked. This is occurring against a backdrop of slow momentum in the economy, a decline in vacancies and a gradually rising unemployment rate. It's a bit surprising. The participation rate has continued to trend upwards, reaching a record high in July. Now, this has not been the experience in most other peer economies. Uh, so participation rates amongst this group have largely begun to stabilise, and in some cases they've actually declined in the most recent data. In contrast, in Australia, the participation rate has continued to increase steadily in the post-pandemic period. So you can see we've sort of moved from middle-ish of the, the band, as it were, uh, towards the top of it. While the slowing in the economy may have weighed on the participation rate, all other things equal, it does look like other factors have provided support, including the longer run trend towards greater female participation. We've also seen the share of employed people with multiple jobs continue to trend upwards since the pandemic, notwithstanding the fall in the latest quarterly data, which you can also see on the chart. So where to from here? Well, to sum up, conditions in the labour market have eased since late 2022, but our assessment is that the labour market is still tight relative to full employment. <coughs> we expect the demand for labour to grow at a slower pace relative to the supply in the coming quarters, gradually bringing the labour market into better balance. Our view is that some of this slowing in labour demand is likely to occur via decline in average hours. We do expect employment to continue to increase, but at a slower pace than population growth. In this view of the outlook, measures of underutilisation, including the unemployment rate, are expected to continue rising gradually from here, before stabilising as the pace of growth in GDP picks up to be broadly consistent with the, the economy's underlying trend pace of growth. Now, as my colleague Andrew Hauser recently pointed out, the outlook is highly uncertain, and we should be humble about our ability to predict the future. If we can be confident about anything, it's that our forecast will be wrong, at least in some way. And I've been forecasting for quite a few years, and that's always been the case. Uh, we therefore spend a lot of time thinking about how and why we could be wrong, including by considering scenarios where the economy evolves differently to our base case forecast, and by continuously updating our assessment of risks as economic conditions change. This is particularly important given that changes in economic conditions can take time to flow through to changes in labour market conditions. So it's possible that employment growth will slow and the unemployment rate rise more quickly than we currently expect. 
what's giving us uh, some uh, comfort in our view right now is that various leading indicators, uh, they are easing and suggesting further softening, uh, but we still think that that easing can come through with a modest increase in the unemployment rate and continued employment growth. One of the main things that we can see in that data is that further, we think that further falls in vacancies can still occur alongside a relatively modest increase in the unemployment rate, as I've just said. Compared to other economies that have seen larger increases in their unemployment rates in the recent cycle, the Australian economy has got a higher ratio of vacancies to unemployment. So that's the number of jobs that businesses and organisations want to hire relative to the number of people that are unemployed. Uh, that's relative to its historical experience. And this su just suggests that there is space for vacancies to fall further without a sharp increase in the unemployment rate. So this outcome is also consistent with our assessment that we're still on the steeper part of the beverage curve, which was the chart I showed you earlier on. But the slope of the beverage curve is highly uncertain. We could be wrong on this. Maybe the curve has shifted. Um, obviously, the data will play out and we'll find out. But right now, we think that there is still space for the vacancy rates uh, to decline and for that not to uh, be uh, seen with a sharp increase in the unemployment rate. Our central forecast is also predicated on the assessment that few firms are operating with excess labour, engaging in so-called labour hoarding. If it turns out that more firms are currently hoarding labour, then we may see a larger pickup in the unemployment rate as firms reduce headcount to cut costs, given the backdrop of weak growth in demand. The implications of this alternative were explored in a scenario in our August Statement on Monetary Policy. It's tucked away towards the back if you've not found your way to it just yet. It is also possible that our assessment is wrong in the other direction. Conditions may be tighter than we expect, or demand for labour could grow more strongly than we anticipate. So forecasting the labour market is a difficult but important challenge. Our current assessment is that labour market dynamics haven't fundamentally changed, although we have been surprised by some of the recent data. While our forecasts are likely to not be right, at least in some way, and we remain humble about our ability to predict the future, uh, we will continue to update our views based on the incoming data and our ongoing analysis. Thank you.